I have three uh, messages for today. The first is that global warming is happening. It's real, it's observed, and uh, it's already increasing the risks that we experience where we live, including here in the Midwest. The second is that we're on a trajectory as a globe, as a planet Earth, uh, that has a high risk for future climate change. And that risk is much bigger uh, if we continue along this trajectory than if the targets that the United Nations has identified and is currently negotiating, if those targets are met. The third is that there's hope. And Stanford's a big part of that hope, because uh, we can be the laboratory for climate innovation that's going to be needed to meet this challenge. This is the record of global temperature. Uh, over the last century and a half or so, and what you see are some wiggles from year to year and decade to decade, but the main thing you see is a clear upward trend, an increase in temperature. Uh, in science, we call that warming. This is global temperature, so we call it global warming. This is not a matter of debate. It's not a matter of politics. It's not a matter of belief. I often get asked, oh, you, you study climate. Do you believe in global warming? If you believe in thermometers, then you too <laughs> believe in global warming. And the reality is, is that not only is the globe warming, but our climate is changing. Our climate is changing uh, all around the globe where we live. Uh, we are tremendously exposed to risks from the climate system, particularly from extreme events. One example of this, uh, just in the US, if we look back at the last decade, there have been more than 70 climate and weather disasters that each have caused more than $1 billion in damage. And we know that many of them, like the current California drought, like the heat and drought in the Midwest in 2012, Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, many of these events have caused multi-billion dollars in damage. And when we look at observations from around the globe, temperature, precipitation, uh, winds, the storm surges, we see all around the world that the uh, increasing intensity and uh, occurrence of extreme events. And right here in the US, we really see this for severe heat and heavy rainfall and uh, storm surge flooding like we saw in New York in, in Superstorm Sandy. So we know that uh, the risks are increasing. And one of the big examples of extreme events and, and the kind of risks they pose comes from this region, from the Midwest. Uh, and many of you probably remember a few years ago in the summer of 2012, the, the severe heat and drought that, uh, that happened in this region. And it had uh, big health impacts. It had big impacts on agriculture. And those, those impacts on agriculture were felt throughout the US economy. And so we've done some work to try to understand this event. And uh, in particular, we've looked at the, the temperature. And uh, this was a really warm summer. It was a really warm summer around the US. Uh, it was the warmest July on record in over a century of observations for the US as a whole. But the bullseye for this event was the Midwest. And you see that in this map here, the dark red that you see on the map over the Midwest. That shows that most of the region experienced the hottest July that was ever recorded in, in uh, human history in, in, in this part of the world. And uh, what we've done in our work is we found that uh, the probability of this kind of extreme heat that happened in, in the summer of 2012 has quadrupled because of the global warming that we've already happened. So I showed you that, that time series of global warming. We've had one degree Celsius of global warming over that last century and a half. And what it's meant is that in regions like the Midwest, we're experiencing a much higher probability of high impact events. The risk is increasing. And we see this really clearly in agriculture. Uh, like I said, in, in the summer of 2012, we had really, really big impacts on agriculture. And we've done some work to try to understand uh, if the UN uh, finds a way, if the global community finds a way to constrain global warming to two degrees, so just we're halfway there, just another, another degree to go. Um, if, if that happens, what are the impacts that, that we're likely to feel? And one of the key impacts is, is in uh, corn production here in the US. The US is the biggest producer of corn in the world. And what we've done is we've looked at the, the historical climate. And you see that in the blue distributions here. This is just the volatility of, uh, of corn yields in the US in the historical climate. And then the red distributions show uh, the two degree global warming target. And what you see is, much uh, higher occurrence of the extremes, the high and low. And what this is is an increase in the volatility of corn yields in the US, the ups and downs. And it's really coming from increasing severe heat like we saw in 2012. And uh, when we work with agricultural economists to try to understand what might be the impacts on the economy, 
we find that this doubling of the corn yield volatility results in a quadrupling of corn price volatility. And that's exactly what we saw in 2012. Big reductions in corn yields and big increases in prices. So again, a global scale change that's uh, potentially having really big impacts right here where we live. Another example where we're exposed to the climate system uh, in the Midwest is severe thunderstorms. And you're very familiar with, with thunderstorms. The most severe ones uh, produce tornadoes and heavy rainfall, flooding, um, very high winds, hail, all of which cause damage year after year after year. And what we've done is we've tried to understand the atmospheric condition, conditions that create these kinds of storms and how, uh, just based on the fundamental laws of physics, how those conditions might change in a global warming world. And what we found, uh, and you might not be surprised now that we're uh, six minutes in, is an increase in the risk of these kinds of extreme events. So this is another example where global warming causes, uh, at the local scales, increases in the risk of the kind of events that we know have, have very high impact. In the case of severe thunderstorms, at that two degree level of global warming that the United Nations is working towards, it's about a 20% increase in the number of days that are supportive of severe storms. And at the four degree level, that doubles to 40%. So what's going on with the United Nations? Right? This, is, this is actually a big topic in the news. There's a big run up to uh, negotiations that are gonna be in Paris in, uh, in uh, December, late November, early December, there's talk of bringing Stanford students uh, to Paris to try to try to uh, observe those negotiations. And what the what the world community is doing is basically trying to turn the ship around in terms of global emissions. And what you see here on the screen, each of these dots is a year of uh, real observations of real emissions of CO2 uh, at the global scale. And you see that over the last three decades or so the global community has doubled its, its emissions of greenhouse gases. So we're on an upward trajectory. And where this will take us, if we continue along this trajectory, is way past that two degree target that the United Nations has put forward, all the way very likely to four degrees by the end of the century. And again, this is a world in which we will be much more at risk for, for high impact climate events. And what the United Nations is targeting, uh, what you'll read about in the newspaper heading up to Paris, is trying to get to two degrees, trying to constrain global warming uh, to just, just one more degree Celsius above what we've already had. And this is possible, it's daunting, but it's possible, but it's gonna require turning the ship around and essentially decarbonizing the economy at the global scale over the next half century. And this is the part of the discussion where usually we all get really hopeless because this is daunting. Uh, but it's not impossible and I am here to say that I have hope. And Stanford is a big part of that hope because uh, it, it's mathematically possible to do this and Stanford, is uh, really becoming a laboratory for innovation. We've heard all about the creativity and innovation that has gone on in the tech sector, and what we're seeing now is around the issues of energy and environment and sustainable development, we're seeing that innovation being applied. And I wanna talk about uh, one example that's just getting off the ground, so this is new news, um, and it's actually coming out of the new uh, Stanford Data Science Initiative uh, that, that's on campus. And what we're doing is we're, we're, uh, we're in a really severe drought in California right now, and I will, uh, anyone who wants to come to the seminar this afternoon, I will uh, talk about our work on the California drought. But what we're doing in this project is seeing if we can combine the strengths in uh, environmental sensing, the Internet of Things, uh, mobile communication, uh, social gamification, and see if we can figure out a way to help humans both monitor and reduce their consumption. In this case, it's water, but it's potentially scalable to a lot of different resources. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to get to be involved in it. It's something that never would have happened uh, without Stanford. And this is the kind of, of innovation that uh, really gives me hope, and I hope that it gives you hope as well. So thank you very much. <music>